Excellent. So our next uh, boot camp uh, lectures are from Russell and Pagliazzo of uh, UC San Diego. He's an authority on many subjects, one of which is derandomization from circuit lower bounds that he will be talking about. So um, someone wants to find remarrying your, your ex as um, the triumph of hope over experience. Um, my my uh, plan for today's talks is probably another tri such triumph. <laughs> um, so the plan is to talk about derandomization based on specific lower bound techniques for an hour, um, and namely um, the Braverman proof of the, the Nissan lineal conjecture, and then uh, in the second hour, talk about uh, generic connections between hardness and between lower bounds and, and derandomization. So, um, so I thought I, I wanted to start um, with a kind of motivating example of an algorithm that we might want to derandomize, okay, or that was derandomized successfully. Um, so this is um, Mike Luby's parallel maximal independent set algorithm. So, um, or a, a, sim a gross simplification thereof. Okay. So, um, so uh, independent set in a graph is a set of vertices, no two of which is connected. It's maximal if you can't add another vertex, or equivalently, if every vertex not in the set has a neighbor in the set. Okay. So, um, so now, if you just want to solve this problem, Finding a maximal as opposed to maximum size independent set is trivial. You just pick any vertex, remove its ver neighbors, and you keep on going. The problem is that's an inherently sequential process. And when I mean inherently sequential, what I mean is Steve Cook showed that it's actually uh, P complete to, to, um, to find the lexicographically first um, such independent set. So um, Mike Luby uh, actually, this was his simplified uh, parallel algorithm to, to find a maximal independent set. There was, there was previous work giving some parallel algorithms for it. And uh, he had a sub-procedure where you found a big independent set that covered lots of vertices. And then you just applied this procedure many times. So the, I'm assuming totally unrealistically that the graph is deregular, meaning every node has D, exactly D neighbors. And then the algorithm becomes for every vertex, you put it in some set J that's like a tentative independent set with probability 1 in 4D. Okay? Um, now, we don't control whether, you know, it's still possible that two neighbors are in the independent set and it's not an independent set at all. So if, there, if, if V has a neighbor also in the, in the tentative independent set, you delete both of them from the independent set. Okay? So, um, and then uh, you you put J in, the things that remain in J are in the independent set, and we can forget about anything that's a neighbor of one of them because they're covered. They'll never be in the independent set, and then we recurse on the rest of the graph. And the object is to to make the rest of the graph as small as possible, show that we're making lots of progress. So the main factor, okay, the J is going to be relatively small. The main factor that we could hope to simplify the graph is the number of neighbors of J. And we can write out a formula for the numbers of neighbors of J in terms of the, the bits that tell us whether we, we put something initially in J or not. So, um, well, so it's like for every I, is it, is it in J at the, um, is it covered by something in J? Well, if it's covered by something in J, we can count it by the first neighbor of I that lands in J. Well, so we can sum up over all neighbors of J that it's the first neighbor. Um, so what does it mean to be the first neighbor that still stays in J? First, we have to initially, it has to be in J. And it can't, there can't be anything earlier that appeared in J. And now we'll be a little bit pessimistic and say, OK, well, to, to be in J at the end, you first have to be in J at the beginning. And you can't have any neighbor of yourself in J. The other thing is uh, to, to be the first one, we'll just assume that you're the first one that was flipped, not necessarily the first one that ends up. So you could be not the first one that's flipped, but still be the first one that ends up in the set. 
But, so we're being a little bit pessimistic here. But as an upper, a lower bound, we can subtract off just uh, the probability that you're in the set initially and something earlier is in the set initially. And now you see, OK, now it's easy to compute the expectation of this quantity. Because what do we have? We have a sum over n things, a sum over d things of a coin flip of probability 1 and 4d. And then we're subtracting off at most d things here of the, of the form sum this probability squared and d things here of the form this probability squared. So we get uh, that the expected number is at least n times d times 1 in 4d, the probability of putting something in, minus the probability of putting two th 2d chances of putting two things in, so 2d over 16d squared. And so we end up with something like n over 8. So we get rid of a constant factor of the graph each iteration, and so we expect to have only log iterations. Now, Mike uh, showed that well, the reason I wrote it out exactly in this formula is what kind of expression is this formula? It's a degree 2 polynomial. Okay. And a degree 2 polynomial only involves interactions between pairs of random, random outcomes. And so that means that we don't actually need randomness for this process. What we need is pairwise randomness, any kind of distribution where pairs of variables um, have the, the right, distri right marginal distribution. And we can sample from a pairwise independent distribution with support n squared. And we can enumerate the support in time n squared. Okay. Um, and, and we can do this in parallel. And try them all and pick the one that's best. Okay. So, um, and Mike had some ideas that were more clever than this. But, but I won't go into those. So, um, so this kind of like the general spirit of de-randomization is you're given a randomized algorithm. You try to think of it as a family of described. So the algorithm has its real input and its random choices. And you think of for each fixed real input, you think of a test about randomness that's what happens when you run that algorithm with that input on a random string. Okay. And what we want is to find a distribution. This is gives, even if we have just one algorithm, this gives a class of tests. And often we we're, we're not only have one algorithm that we're looking at, but a whole class of algorithms. And so we want to find a distribution that fools all this, the, the entire class of tests. In other words, where um, the expectation on the distribution of any test in the class is very close to the expectation on a random distribution. And one, uh, just some notation that I'm going to use is if we have a, a Boolean function or even a real valued function in a distribution, I'm just going to write t of that distribution to mean the expected value when we pick an input from the distribution of, of the function. Okay. And this just saves, just saves a, a few, uh, a few uh, lines, a few symbols every time, but symbols that are going to appear so often that uh, saving a constant factor makes a difference. Okay. Um, so when we have such a distribution, we, go, we do what Mike did. We go through all the, the random strings that are in the support of the distribution. And we run the algorithm in parallel or sequentially or however we want uh, for each such, such support in place of the randomness. And then we use the majority or best answer or whatever is appropriate to the problem. Okay. And uh, so the important thing here is that um, it's really important that the support of our distribution be really small. Because we're going to be exhaustively searching that support. And it's kind of mildly important that we can, we can generate the elements of the support in about the same amount of time. Okay. Um, so the most important thing is small support or compression. The somewhat important thing is efficient generation. And I just want to say that 
uh, and both of these are very likely to be small, but comparable, but a little bit larger than the resources of the algorithm we're trying to fool. Okay. So, um, um, okay. And the reason I want to say that, make a point of that, is that there's a dual, there's another application uh, besides the randomization for pseudorandomness, and that's in cryptography. In cryptography, if you're using um, a pseudorandom generator to generate seeming randomness that you're going to use for cryptographic applications to pick your cryptographic keys to, um, or nunces for, for padding your, your input um, for probabilistic encryption, it's you know, important, mildly important, but you know, it's, it's, it's important, but not the most important thing, that the, the way you want to save randomness, so you want to use fewer random bits than, um, than you're generating. Okay, a pseudorandom generator that uses more randomness than it's outputting is not a very good pseudorandom generator. So the, and, and so the support of D must be non-trivial, much less than two to the n. Okay, um, but what's really important is that the time to sample from this distribution has to be much smaller than um, the time that we're trying to fool, the resources that we're trying to fool. So the resources to sample have to be sm here smaller. Here, they just have the time to sample just doesn't have have to, has to be not a huge amount bigger. Okay, and so the kind of results that you get for in the cryptographic setting, the assumptions that you need for pseudorandom generators are really different from the assumptions that suffice, uh, and different and stronger than the assumptions that suffice um, in the uh, de-randomization setting. For that reason, um, I, refer, I try to only call pseudorandom generators the cryptographic side and just call this side pseudorandom distributions. I don't promise to totally stick to that because I'm fighting history. <laughs> okay, um, but um, on the other hand, a lot of the fundamental work that um, that went into studying pseudorandomness in the cryptographic setting by people like Shamir, Blum, Macaulay, Yao, and others um, transports over. Some of it transports over, and some of it doesn't. And you, so you have to be a little bit careful, but. A lot of the, there's a lot of reuse of the cryptographic approach, which actually came a little bit earlier. Mr. Russell, why do you say that this con condition is only somewhat important? I mean, it's well, it's, it's important, but it's it's not as important as on this side. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, okay. Well, well I say it's somewhat important condition. because it's usually pretty easy to to achieve <laughs> because because the standard is kind of relaxed. It's not so hard to achieve. But you can, you can gen, I mean, if you had a lot Okay, of if, if it were it. true, it's still, it's still important. Right. It's just, this is the most important. And here, this is still important, but this is the most important. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe I should just remove somewhat and just say, no, important. most important, also important. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so the interesting thing um, about, or one of the interesting things about uh, using lower bounds to, to de-randomize, so we said when we phrase it in terms of finding a distribution that fools a test, we're phrasing it in terms of the distribution poses a hard problem to the class of, to the amount of resources that the tests are from to the class that the test is from. The hard problem being, tell the difference, be, is this real randomness or is this pseudorandomness? So that's a hard problem, and so that's the, kind of the connection between having hard lower bounds and de -random, first constructing pseudorandom distributions and then coming up with algorithms that deterministically simulate randomized algorithms. So the whole process forms one of the fulcrums in complexity where we're able to change direction. Where proving a stronger lower bound, moving the lower bound up, 
moves the upper bound down. Okay. And Ryan was talking about some approaches on the other side where moving the upper bound down increased the lower bound. And if you look inside his approaches, you'll see this fulcrum. <laughs> There's like a few changes of direction. So once you've got a few, a few of these operating in multiple directions, you have like a whole machinery that you can put together. Okay. So, um, Okay, the thing I just erased is what I want to talk about now. <laughs> okay. Um, the, uh, the, first, the first kind of class, so the, what I, what I want to talk about as a first example is started as a life as the Nissan lineal conjecture, became the Braverman theorem. And then, actually, I just learned this uh, today. Um, uh, uh, Maybe we'll, we'll have time to talk about the, the towel improvement to the uh, Braverman theorem. And this actually, um, Ben, this is related to what Ben was talking about uh, yesterday afternoon. Um, so, um, What, what, and oh, so like, so what Ben started talking about is, uh, so we have this class AC0. Okay, and um, I'm gonna have to beg to differ with Pavel. AC0 is a really important class and not just a surrogate <laughs> for what, where, we, where we've been going. So AC0 represents what you can do in constant parallel time on natural architectures is also logically important because it's, it's the uh, non-uniform version of first order. Um, and because, also because, um, because it represents constant parallel time, very fast parallel time, this is um, appropriate, appropriate model for hardware implementations and an appropriate model possibly for things happening inside our brain, uh, especially like visual processing where we have to recognize things really quickly or else be eaten by tigers. <laughs> okay. So, um, okay, but maybe, maybe that's like TC0 rather than AC0 in the brain. Okay, so um, you, think, you think we wouldn't recognize a tiger if it ate us? <laughs> okay. So, um, so anyway, um, the, the Luby algorithm was the closest I could think of to a natural randomized AC0 algorithm. But, um, so what we'll show is that um, generalizing that, that instead of pairwise independence, uh, the size independence fools AC0. In other words, any is generalizing pairwise to polylogwise independence, where the bits are any polylogwise size collection of bits looks in, is marginally uniformly distributed, um, creates a distribution that's suitable for derandomizing any algorithm in, in this class AC0 that Ben talked about yesterday. And I think it's been talked about enough that I won't define AC0. So, um, and uh, sort of the connection um, is already kind of clear from what, what Ben, this kind of intuition is kind of clear from what Ben was saying uh, yesterday. 
because what, what um, the random restriction methods tell us is that an AC0 formula F is kind of close to um, a decision tree. You know, it's, it's once you like do anything to it, it becomes a kind of small depth decision tree. And a depth D decision tree is a depth, is a, it, you can write it directly as a degree D polynomial. And uh, dy's independence, just as we as we argued with Luby's algorithm, perfectly fools degree D polynomials in that the expectation isn't just close; it's exactly the same because of linearity of expectations. Each term involves at most d variables. The d variables are identically distributed, and so the, the total expectation of any polynomial is the same under any d-wise independent distribution, um, including the uniform distribution. So, so this is a degree d polynomial over the reals? Or? Over the reals, yes. So where is the intuition failing over, so over GF2 parities? And well, so then, I'm not sure what additivity of, if additivity of expectations really works mod 2. <laughs> or, I mean, this came, this came up last, last week when I was talking about this, and I still I had the same answer. So if someone can like, define a version of mod 2, that would be really, really good. Okay. So, um, so, yes? You said the problem is when you're talking about the expectation <coughs> and the distinguishing gap, is, that's why mod 2 doesn't work? Well, well, when you have a polynomial mod 2, okay. usually what you mean by representing a, a function is that, say, 99% of the time it's equal to the function. Okay. Mod 2. How do you make that into an expectation? Mod 2. Okay, so the 1% of the time where it fails, is that uh, an even 1% of the time or an odd 1% of the time? The fact that it's just 1% doesn't help us with that. Could you not define distinguishability with like the probability the distinguisher outputs 1 or 0 or something and look at that guy? But I, don't, I think that doesn't help. Okay. But, um, so I'll, I'll leave that as a challenge. I'm not even going to say it's an open problem because I don't know how to define it. Um, but to come up with any version that, that makes sense over a finite field, um, I think that would be interesting. So, so right now we have to like keep it should respect the fact that n bits with parity is conditioned to be one of n minus one in n. So, I think this was, this was Oh, you say, so here's like a counterexample. I'm not sure what is yeah. the framework, but... Uh, saying, so like, you can, if you look at all inputs whose parity is zero, it's n minus one independent, but it certainly doesn't fool parity. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Even though parity is a very small degree polynomial mod two. <laughs> Is that what you were saying? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, so we want some senses in which so we want to formalize this connection a little bit more to try to say that um, a function in AC0 can be represented by, um, by a, uh, uh, a polynomial over the real numbers 
represented or approximated, and hence um, that uh, that means that dy's independence is going to fool that AC0 uh, function because it's going to fool the approximating polynomial. And we're going to see a couple of ways to do this approximation. Okay. And the clever part of Braverman's argument is that he, both of these ways don't work um, to do what I just said, but if you combine them cleverly, he was able to get them to work. So, um, so the first sense in which we can approximate um, a polynomial in AC0 is, uh, is dates back to, to lineal Mensur and Nassan. Um, we showed that there's that AC0 functions have Fourier concentration. And I'm going to define what this is. So, um, so to, to do this, we're going to do a little bit of a shift. By a little bit of a shift, I mean a linear transformation. <laughs> so instead of like thinking of the Boolean inputs as 0, 1, we're temporarily going to think of of 0 as 1 and 1 as minus 1. So look at minus 1 to this bit. Okay. And the, the advantage is now that the parity function goes to the product. Okay. And these products become an orthogonal basis in the, in the following sense. If we define an inner product between two functions, as the expectation of f of x times g of x for a random x. Um, any two parities, two parity functions, distinct parity functions, have expectation zero because, see, the xi squares just become one. The parts where they have in common disappear. The parts where they're different uh, have degree one and they're just as likely to be 1 and minus 1 fixing the others, uh, so they just cancel. So this forms an orthono or orthonormal basis, and so um, we can write any function in terms of this basis. So when we do that, we write f as a sum alpha s, where s is a subset of 1 to n of the product i and s, of xi. And now um, it's actually easy to see that these alphas have, a, have an intuitive definition. They're just um, the correlation of the function with the corresponding parity. Does this make sense? So it's also true because it's an orthonormal um, transformation and because f is now 1 or minus 1, so we're also thinking of f as taking values 1 and minus 1, f's L2 norm is just 1 because f squared is always 1. And that means the same thing is true when you write it in this representation. So the sum of alpha of f squared is just 1. So it means you can sort of like think of these alpha, the coefficient squared, as a kind of probability distribution. And you say, okay, where is the mass of that distribution? Where is it concentrated? And uh, what they showed is that the mass of the distribution is on, is on sets that are small. Almost all Fourier mass. is on sets S where the size of S is small. Let me uh, try to make that a little bit more precise. And I'll also try to give a proof. So, 
Chen theorem that if f has a depth d size s circuit, then the sum of all where s so that size of s is greater than order log s over epsilon to the d, and there's some constant here. So all of this, so the constant also gets raised to the d. Um, of alpha of s squared is at most epsilon. Okay, and what I just found out uh, at Ben's talk and then confirmed with Avishai is that there's actually been an improvement that's going to actually make a difference later on. The improvement is a little bit subtle. So, so you can, instead of having the S and the epsilon be treated equally in this, hopefully I'm getting this right, is Maybe the depth is d plus one, like in Ben's. D plus one, okay. Totally like both of them. No, no, okay. okay. I meant d minus, d minus one, or the depth is d plus one. But yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm gonna ignore that. <laughs> but this is this is right, right? Okay. So that means that we can actually improve it, and you get the the same consequence. Okay. And so that's. A, a fairly big improvement when we want a very small approximating error um, and have a fixed size. Okay, but I'm gonna I'm gonna give the original LMN argument because I don't know this one. Maybe Avishai will give it some other time. <laughs> okay. So. Um, Um, so let's see what happens to those Fourier coefficients. So we want to look what happens. So what we, we understand is what happens to, um, to AC0 functions under random restrictions. Let's see what happens to, um, to the Fourier expansion under restrictions. And now, to make it simple, let's look at what happens to the Fourier uh, coefficient, uh, coefficients when you just restrict by one variable. Let's say x. So you want to use a different pen variable. Okay. Which one do I want to use? Blue? I don't know. Blue, Blue is good. <laughs> okay. So, um, so we have like the original function. Uh, is uh, alpha of s this, yeah. f of x is the sum of these alpha Fourier coefficients times these products. Um, so let's look at what happens when the first variable gets one and the first variable gets minus one. Well, just look at, plug that into this formula and this is gonna be like sum over S subset of two through N. So we're combining the terms that have S as the subset for the other variables and either have an X one in them or not. So, uh, uh, when it, okay, so when it doesn't have x1 in it, I'll put a zero here, that doesn't change because the value of x1 is irrelevant. Here we're plugging in x1 equals one, so we add in the coefficient of s union x1. So the new Fourier coefficient is the sum. 
and this is the same, except what do you think the new Fourier coefficient is going to be? Minus. Minus. OK. And then the nice thing is, let's look at what happens. OK, and this happens with probability a half. This happens with probability a half. So let's look at the average square of the Fourier coefficient. Okay. Well, you get a half of this squared. You get a, this squared plus twice the, inner, the product plus this squared. Same thing except minus. So um, you get two squares and then each one at half. So, um, so that means the expectation of you know, alpha of s is the expectation of or alpha prime of s when we do the, the squared is uh, alpha of s union 1 squared plus alpha s squared. So these two just sort of move over in expectation to this 1. So things just move down proportionally. The mass doesn't really change. The length of the vector doesn't really change. It just moves over. So, um, okay, so what's going to happen when we do a random restriction with multiple variables? What that means is that if we've got a term alpha of s product i and s, xi, then its mass and expectation, we just think of which variable, pick at random the variables we're going to leave as stars, and we're going to set the others at random, its mass alpha s squared becomes, be, gets moved down in expectation to s intersect rho inverse of star. The places of star. So uh, in particular, if this starts at, if we start with something of, of size t, okay. um, then, and, and rho is picked leaving from the distribution rp, then we expect this to move to about, um, to a set of size p times t. Okay. So, um, so that means if we restrict with probability p, the mass that was at size t moves down in expectation to, to size pt. On the other hand, what's going to happen if we get us, if it becomes a small decision tree, then the high degree terms just disappear because there's just one way of writing this as a, as a multilinear polynomial. And there, you know, you can write it in terms of the depth of the decision tree. So that part just disappears. So the only way that we, we could have this mass moving into the small parts and, um, and yet the small, the, sorry, into the, the large mass move into the medium size mass. And the medium size mass doesn't exist with high probability. It's if there weren't very many large mass, the, the large mass was small to begin with. So, um, okay. So I could try to spell that out, but, um, but since I have so little time, I won't, <laughs> I think. Um, unless there's mass rebellion at this point. <laughs> maybe, maybe, yeah. So maybe you should mention that like, you, need, you need the switching lemma. Uh, okay, so to, to, to get the conclusion, we need the switch. We, so I said the, okay. Okay, so maybe I will spell it out. <laughs> okay, so what we know is if we pick P to be one in log S over epsilon to the d minus 1. And this is like, so like, then the probability that f restricted by rho, that the decision tree, is greater or equal to this log s over epsilon is less than or equal to epsilon. Um, and that's, that's exactly what the, the multiple layers of the switching lemma said. Okay, so um, if you combine it with this, you say, okay, 
that means the expect uh, the expected part um, for the expectation over of alpha of s squared uh, or alpha prime of s squared when f prime equals f restricted by rho and s um, is greater or equal to um, this log s over epsilon is at most epsilon. Because, okay, so why is this true? Well, if, this ha if the decision tree, unless this happens, this is zero. And even if it doesn't happen, we know that all the squares are, are one, so the, the, the squares that we're counting are at most one. So probably epsilon, we get something at most one, with other, otherwise we get exactly zero. Yes? You've got two meanings of s there, the subset for the subscript and this the This is s. a little s. Oh, that's a little s for sure. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, it's a matter of perspective. <laughs> Uh, okay, so um, so so um, and on the other hand, we said that this is also this expectation is is greater than or equal to the sum over all sets where um, s is greater or equal to uh, this log s over epsilon over p which works out to about this, of the original Fourier mass. Because all of these set, all of this Fourier mass ends up in this, in this region with good probability. And I'm, I'm, I'm cheating, there's like a factor of two, but who cares? Okay. So, um, so that means that in the original distribution, the large Fourier coefficients were smaller than epsilon. And uh, this improvement is by sort of like, here we we're like being very symmetrical in how we're treating the epsilon and the s and making sure we're doing a union bound at every step. And I think like the new multi uh, switching lemmas allow you to kind of to do a finer distinction between the dependence on s and the dependence on epsilon. Okay. Um, so that's one sense in which we can approx, oh. So I should say, um, how, what, in what sense is this a good approximation of the original function? So if we let f be the original function and f tilde be the part of the original function, where s is less than this degree this degree bound that we get over here. This is no longer a Boolean function. But it's a real valued function. But I'm say, saying it's, it's very close to f. Why? Because we know the part that we're leaving out, the sum of the alpha squares is at most epsilon. But that means that the, in other words, what that's saying is that the L2 norm squared of the difference of these functions is the part that we left out. And that's, that part is less than epsilon. <coughs> so since the L2 norm is the si same when you look at the Fourier basis as it is when you look at the, the value basis, this is saying the expectation of f of x minus f tilde of x quantity squared is the most epsilon. And give a, a, a couple of consequences of this. Because the expectation of a square is always bigger than the square of an expectation, it follows that the expectation of the absolute value is the most square root of epsilon. And uh, here's something that's a little bit less, less obvious. The expectation of the difference of the squares is at most order square root of epsilon. 
Um, okay, I think I'll, uh, maybe I'll work this out. This, is, this takes like a little bit of calculation, but not too much. So this is, this, this is the same as f of x minus f tilde of, of x. And here I have like absolute value times f of x plus f tilde of x. OK. And now I'm going to do a, a, something a little bit cheap. I don't know what f tilde is, but I know f has uh, absolute value 1. It's not too, too, too huge. So I'm going to write this as expectation of f of x minus f tilde of x times 2 f of x plus f tilde of x minus f of x. And then use uh, triangle inequality. See? This is at most 2 times the expectation of the difference. plus the expectation of the difference, 180 squared. Okay. And we already have this less than square root of epsilon and this less than epsilon. Okay. So, so these, these three senses are, in are senses in which this function is a low degree function that's a good approximation to our original function. Okay. Um, so let me give another kind of approximation. Um, and it's very similar to um, this other approximation um, is very similar in spirit to the rosborough smolensky approach to proving lower bounds over finite fields. Okay. Um, so we're going to work our way up from the bottom and come up with a polynomial that usually equals our function. So, um, so remember, or if you don't know, the, the, the point is to like approximate the, the circuit gate by gate. Okay. Um, in rosborough smolensky what they do is they, they say we're like approximating by a low degree polynomial mod 2. We pick random r's and we take these inputs and we think, okay, let's look at sum of ri xi. If all of these are 0, this is always 0. If any of them is 1, this is 1 with probability of half. So if we like do this a number of times, Parity? Yeah. Mod 2. Mod 2. Uh, right. In you know, up to j some t. And uh, take the OR with pretty good probability, this is actually the OR. Okay? It's probably except for my 2 to the minus t. We won't do the same thing over the real numbers. We can't do mod 2. But here's, and, and if we just pick these ri's at random, and there are lots of xi's, the chance of here we want to like say exactly 1 versus 0. Fortunately, um, Valiant and Vazirani showed that there is a distribution over subsets. J subset of 1 through n, so that for any non-empty A, the probability that the size of A intersect J equals 1 is at least 1 in log n, in order log n. So if we think of, apply this then they gave a very nice construction. We don't need that. The main idea is just to, to sort of guess how dense this, the set A is, how big the set A is, and then pick a probability 
inversely proportional to the density, so you expect to have about one. Okay. And so you have to like make sure you pick all kinds of range of sizes, which is where the log comes in. But uh, they, they gave a very nice explicit construction. Okay, so um, if we do this, what we'll do is like look at the product of the sum, pick many samples from this distribution, and what? So we'll do this t times and look at this product. Now, what happens, um, or maybe I should put a plus one and minus one here. So if all the xj's are zero, we always get one. If any of them are non-zero because of this property, with good probability about one in log n, we get, um, we get um, uh, the value zero. So this is, you know, one, one minus this is going to be a good representation of the OR function. Uh, meaning almost always equal to the OR function. And here you said t to be like order log. So, t, so here the error probability is 1 minus order log n or log of the fan n, which is at most 1 in log of the circuit size to the t is our probability of error, which is exponential and negative t over order log s. So we need to make t uh, bigger than, so we need to make t equal to like log epsilon over s to make sure we can do a union bound at the end. S over epsilon. Yes. One of those others times log of s. So, um, so we could upper, we could bound it by just the log squared. Okay. So, um, so this gives a, a probabilistic polynomial that I'll call little f that's representing our function big F. Okay. Um, and little f has the property that if I use these parameters, the probability that little f is different from big F is at most epsilon. Okay. And the degree of little f, well, we have to use this value of t, and that means that we like raise the previous degrees to the t's power at every depth, so the degree of f is going to be t to the d, which is like order log s over epsilon to the 2d. So the probability is over what? The probability is over the random choices of these sets. Oh, so it's not the choice of little f? Of, of little j's. So we pick j's from this value in Vazirani construction, and maybe they work and maybe they don't. And so then this is not that the function f, little f, is identical to the function capital F, right? So it's identical except when, when one of these fails. When one of these, except with probability epsilon. The thing is, when it's not identical, um, it can be way off. It's like for every, for every x, you pick something random, and then the probability for that x yeah. is good. So, this, so the nice thing is that this is true not just under the uniform distribution, but on any distribution, because we're doing this probabilistic construction on each input. You can think of it the same, dis, you know, same distribution, input by input. So, uh, so here we have that the, the probability that f is different from f is less than equal epsilon, but when f is different from f, f 
is not Boolean and could take a value up to the size of the circuit to t to the d is like 2 to the log to the log s over epsilon to uh, So when, when, uh, when f is wrong, it's very, very wrong. Um, or it could be. Yeah. So uh, when I presented this in class, someone reminded me of the, of the nursery rhyme about the girl with the curl. <laughs> that when she was good, she was very, very good. But when she was bad, she was horrid. <laughs> so, um, so when the function is good, which is most of the time is very, very good, but when it's bad, it's horrid. The nice, nice thing is that this holds under any distribution, um, unlike the Fourier approximation that only is close to the function under the uniform distribution. Okay, so I think I will be, I will tone down my ambitions and maybe not get to the gener generic case and just continue this after the break because sort of like it seems like we're all finally getting somewhere. <laughs> so, um, so why don't we take the break now and then like try to put these pieces together after the break.